In Myrtle Beach, you always go at your own pace. Lie out on the sand, lie out by the pool, go boogie boarding, go surfing, walk the boardwalk, walk the marsh walk, golf at one of 90 golf courses, mini golf at one of 50 mini golf courses, fish off a pier, fish from a chartered boat, go shopping, get drinks, eat the freshest seafood. The list is exhaustive, but the experience isn't. You can go all out or do nothing at all. How you relax is up to you. There is so much to do and explore, whether you're traveling with friends, family, or just yourself. With 60 miles of beach, you're going to find your place. If this sounds like what you need, then this is where you belong. Twisted Tea and Myrtle Beach Wholesaler Better Brands Incorporated know our consumers enjoy relaxing days on the water with Twisted Tea's original hard iced tea in hand. It's important to remember drink and boat responsibly. Choose to be or designate a sober skipper before leaving the dock. Do it for your family and your friends, your passengers, and everyone else on board. Twisted Tea salutes all sober skippers who take the pledge. Cheers, and we'll see you on the water. Realtree has always had a connection to the fishing industry and the outdoor lifestyle. In 2016, Realtree expanded on the traditional business of creating the world's most effective camouflage patterns to create a fishing brand and family of patterns designed to connect the woods to the water and strengthen the bond between the two worlds. We couldn't be more excited to be working with the industry's top brands, retailers, and anglers to continue our growth, and we hope that you will join us. Enjoy Realtree fishing patterns inshore, offshore, on the lake, or at the dock. Learn more about the extensive line Realtree fishing patterns, apparel, gear, and more at Realtree.com. Trilogy Outdoors. All right, folks, welcome back to another exciting episode of Trilogy Outdoors. And um, my esteemed colleague, Senator Stephen Goldfish, and I are actually alone in the studio today. And we have a guest joining us via phone. But I tell you what, you know, living in the South, there is one thing that we constantly deal with in the summertime. Oh, spring, summer, fall. Uh, pretty much if it's over 50 degrees, we're going to deal with them, and that is the mosquito. Yeah, how about that? Um, clearly, we deal with mosquitoes on a regular basis uh, here in the south, and, and you know, believe it or not, they actually deal with them heavily in Canada and Alaska and some of those areas as well. But we wanted to bring this to you because I actually brought, read a book recently by Dr. Timothy Weingard, who's a professor uh, out at Colorado Mesa, and um, fascinating book about how the mosquito has changed the history of the world. And it was so interesting to me, I thought you might want to know a little bit about it. It's changed the history of the world, but especially the history of the United States and South Carolina. Well, fins, fur, and feathers, you know we're going to cover it right here on Trilogy Outdoors. And I don't know why not to throw in a mosquito in there, because I think as you'll learn in today's episode, that uh, mosquitoes have played a very large role in the development of our universe. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And um, and we're pleased today to welcome Dr. Timothy Weingard, who's gonna tell us a little bit about it. Dr. Weingard, are you on the line? Yep. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, uh, man. We have a, a- Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. I, I read your book. I was telling our audience, um, I read your book and it was just fascinating to me. I mean, clearly the mosquito has influenced the world, but I mean, I, I really, I had never really wrapped my head around how much until I read your book, and I began to see a pattern. Uh, civilization itself has been molded around the mosquito. Is that an understatement? No, I don't think that's an understatement at all. Um, you know, we're sometimes driven by our own hubris as a species, and we like to think that, you know, we control our own destiny in a way, and that's certainly not the case. There's outside influences. We share our planet with, you know, tons of other animals and, and organisms. So uh, in this case, the mosquito has driven, largely driven human history from, you know, from, from our inception. Yeah. One of the things in your book, I've actually got it in front of me. I pulled it back out last night. I read it a few months ago, but I pulled it back out last night because there was just, there are so many fascinating quotes in your book. And one of them that I pulled out, I wanted to read just because it, it just hit me so hard. And here it is. I want to read it. Prior to 1750, in its hardest hit regions of rice and indigo plantations, which is here in South Carolina, an astonishing 80 per, 86% of European American babies died before they reached the age of 20. 
with 35% dying before the age of five. A typical youthful South Carolina couple married in 1750 represents the norm of their 16 children. On average, only six survived into adulthood. Just incredible. Wow. I mean, to think about today, I would say that almost all babies survive today. I don't know if it's 95 or 99%, but it's got to be right up there at the top. Obviously, we've had some huge advances in medicine, but 86% of babies' children died prior to 1750. Incredible uh, statistic. Unbelievable. Yeah, and that's that's not just for mosquito-borne pathogens, so a lot of that would have been malaria, which unfortunately 90% of malarial deaths are children under the age of five. Their immune systems just simply can't handle um, the overwhelming, uh, I guess, you know, <laughs> reproduction of malaria in, in their blood and livers. Um, so, but that, you know, this is before modern vaccines. So diphtheria was a huge killer of children um, in, in the past before before the vaccine came out in the 1890s and early 1900s. So there's a, a whole slew of childhood diseases um, that impacted that statistic. But certainly for South Carolina, given um, its climate um, and ecology, a lot of that would have been malaria. Yeah, malaria, uh I guess the three major killers are malaria, dengue fever, and yellow fever would have been the three major killers. Yeah, dengue isn't actually a huge killer. Yellow of the virus class, yellow fever is by far the, uh, or was prior to to the vaccine in the 1930s. Um, Yellow fever was by far the biggest killer of the virus class, yes. Gotcha. Dengue was the one, or is the one, that causes elephantitis of the limbs, right? Ooh. Nope, that's a worm, actually. That's called uh, uh, fil- um, filarial worms. So they block the lymph system or the lymphatic system and cause the swelling or engorgement of the limbs and genitals. Um, so that's a quick fix, actually, with modern cheap, cheap medication. But over 100 million people still suffer from that annually just because they live in um, regions of the world where they're underdeveloped and don't have access to that medicine. So that one is a mosquito-borne pathogen as well, but that, but that's a, wor- a worm very similar in, you know, to canine heartworm. We all love our dogs, and canine heartworm is also caused by um, mosquitoes. Yeah, I mean, it, it, all, it all comes back to mosquitoes. There was another quote in your book, I, and I couldn't find it last night, but um, it, it was like in the history of the world, obviously there's been a lot of people. All right, you're getting ready to go to my question. You're taking my question. Go ahead. Yeah, but in, in the history <laughs> of the world, it, it was some incredible number of people that had died directly because of the mosquito. It, do you remember how many people that was or what the quote was? It was like 100 billion now, people. The argument that I've heard is that half of civilization, here, here's what this is what I read, that half of civilization has died in some way due to the mosquito. And there's a big argument about yeah. that. <laughs> that statistic actually comes from a, a Nobel Prize winner, um, polymath in genetics, mathematics, and medicine. So that's what he won his Nobel Prize for. His name's Brock Blumberg, and he's the one who put together that estimate um, in the 1980s, and then it's kind of been extrapolated upon. Um, so again, it's an estimate, and we will never obviously know for sure. Um, but as I say, even if that estimate is high, uh, it certainly doesn't discount, um, as my book <laughs> clearly shows, the impact that the mosquito has had on the trajectory of human history and certain pivotal events in our his- you know, human history. So, and right down to our DNA with sickle cell and thalassemia and Duffy antigen negativity to try to fight um, malaria through the genetic um, shields of natural selection. So, um, that's where that statistic comes from originally. And I want to get to that because the Gullah Geechee slave culture is still very, um, you know, the shadows of that are still very, very prevalent here in South Carolina and the South t- today. And so I want to get into those, um, immunity is not the right word, but I want to get into some of those adaptations the body has created. Um, but I mean, we jump right into some statistics. One of the other things I wanted to mention before we get into some of, some of the more detailed stuff was there are some fairly famous individuals, I mean, really historic, historical individuals that have died because of malaria, yellow fever. And um, if I'm not mistaken, Alexander the Great 
it's attributed, the mosquito is attributed to his death, or malaria or yellow fever is attributed to his death, correct? Mal malaria, yeah, and malaria. again, his body has gone um, uh, gone missing. He was buried eventually in Alexandria, the city he founded in Egypt. <laughs> that bears his name. Um, and his body went missing, so we'll never be able to know for sure, but the symptoms that were recorded um, in the journals prior to his death and the symptoms and time frame of his fevers and his death in Babylon uh, certainly all point to falciparum uh, uh, malaria. Okay, so Alexander the Great, Hannibal, right? Han uh, Hannibal doesn't. He contracts malaria. Uh, it kills his wife and son, and it, he loses an eye from the fevers of malaria. He doesn't die of malaria, though, no. Okay, who else? Oh, Dante the poet. I'm trying to think of other... Um, other um, I'm trying to think. Who wrote the Confessions? Um, the Confessions? St. Augustine. St. Augustine. Um, yeah, so who else? I mean, Genghis Khan is attributed in part to malaria and festering wounds and basically just being so depleted from everything. Um, so there's a whole slew of people in history. But again, even if malaria doesn't kill you, and this is important when you know we talk about some of the wars, where and, and I was in the military, and obviously, um, and this is very pragmatic, but a sick soldier is more of a drain on the military machine than a dead one because not only do they still need to be replaced, they continue to use valuable resources. So if you're laid up for months with malaria, or you have, uh, as we'll see with, with General Cornwallis and the British at Yorktown, um, if you have you know, 65% of your, your troops laid up with malaria, they can't fight. Uh, and if that's your population in general, they can't farm, they can't mine. So it's a drain not just on militaries but on, on societies, and that's essentially what happens to Rome. Uh, is it, Malaria in the surrounding marshes of Rome just bleeds its vitality. So the Pontine marshes were largely responsible, I guess. Pontine, that's the way you pronounce that, right? The Pontine marsh, marshes? Pontine, yeah. Pontine marshes were largely responsible for the malarial infections in that part of the world. And, and you, I'm glad you started back with, um, I mean, I, we can go all the way back to the Peloponnesian Wars and or even prior and, and move forward, you know, through Genghis Khan into the American Wars. But, uh, I mean, that it, it truly has shaped those who won, those who lost. You, in fact, in your book, you call the mosquito, I think, the, the ultimate warrior. I mean, the, it just depends on whose side you're on. But obviously, if you've lived there, you've been what you call in the book seasoned to, uh, to malaria or yellow fever. Can you explain a little bit about seasoning? So malaria isn't a virus. It's not a bacteria. It's a very sophisticated uh, protozoan plasmodium parasite, if you will, that has a seven-stage life cycle that both happens in the mosquito and in human beings or um, the zoological Noah's Ark of other animals, animals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, uh, all the great apes, they all have malaria or their types of malaria. In humans, we have five um, different um, strains, if you will, of malaria. So that's partly why it's so difficult to eradicate is it's not a virus in the true sense where um, smallpox, for example, we've eradicated with vaccines off the face of the planet. So vaccines in the traditional sense don't work. So essentially what seasoning means is, and I don't suggest this as an inoculation strategy for malaria, but the more you suffer, the less you suffer. So the, with repeat infections of malaria, you develop a, a type of you know low immunity, but certainly the symptoms, the chances of death get less every time, and the symptoms get a, a little bit um, more benign with repeat infections. So that's what seasoning is. So if you're uh, an army that's coming from outside the malarial zone and coming, you know, as a foreign army coming to attack, you're not seasoned to that local malaria. So, for example, we see this. Uh, in Italy, in Rome, with the Roman Empire, we see this with the, the Visigoths, the Vandals, um, the Huns, uh, the Carthaginians. When they all come to attack Rome, the nickname for malaria is, is the Roman fever, and actually malaria in Italian, malaria, means bad air. Um, so they're cut to pieces by malaria where the, the Italians or the Romans are, are seasoned to their own blend of malaria. But again, at the same time, eventually they keep getting sick. And, and you know, when you're sick, you can't farm, you can't work the mine. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. 
um, the mosquito, malarious mosquitoes in the Pontine Marshes safeguard Rome from foreign invaders um, in the list that I mentioned, but also at the same time are slowly bleeding the vitality of Rome itself. Yeah. So, I mean, is it is it too far? Is it going too far to say that the Roman Empire survived as long as it did because of malaria? Yeah, in a way, you could say that. There's certainly other factors. Nothing in history is usually um, dependent on one single factor. Sure, it's usually a web of actors and players. But certainly, malaria acted as a shield for for the Roman Empire. There's no question about that, and and we see it in the primary sources in 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 the writings that you know Hannibal's bombing around Italy for more than 15 years, and he never attacks Rome. And there's numerous reasons for that, as he's trying to turn Roman, um, Italian provinces to his side, but also he understands that he, he, he can't lay siege to Rome because to lay siege to Rome would be to essentially encamp your army in these marshes. And also, if you look at how Hannibal fought, he's, uh, he's not, they're not equipped or trained to, for siege warfare, but, but certainly malaria was a huge part of that. Um, and we see this again time and again uh, throughout history um, with these foreign armies trying to conquer Rome. And sometimes they come for a couple of days and quickly leave when malaria starts to, to sap into them. And we see this again with the, the Huns, the Visigoths, the Vandals, um, you know, across history. So it's an interesting kind of case study, if you will, when we look at the rise of Rome, the rise and fall of Rome in a way with malaria being kind of the, the lens to look at that story. Mm. So we're going to jump from, uh, you know, 0 AD or 200, B, 200 BC to 1496. Um, there's a lot in between uh, here and there, but um, talk to me about the Columbian Exchange. It, it, there's something you call the Columbian Exchange in your book, which I think is essentially when uh, – well, tell me what it is. I, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You tell me what the Columbian Exchange is. <laughs> Well, obviously, we all, you know, species across the planet, and in, in, including human beings, evolve in our own ecosystems, and that survival pressures dictate how how we evolve, and 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 you know how our you know civilizations evolve as well. So everything evolves differently based on pressures, environmental pressures for natural selection and survival of the fittest. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. So. What happens with what Columbus essentially kicks off, and that's the term Columbia, Columbian exchange, is I, I, I equate it to imagine a deck of cards being the natural world order, and I'm a huge Star Wars fan, so I call it the balance to the force, and, the, and then throwing that deck of cards into the wind. It's a rearrangement of ecosystems, plants, and animals across the planet, for better or for worse, uh, that comes on the heels of Columbus with the European exploration, colonization, and imperialism. So obviously, for example, Africans evolved in Africa, not in the Americas. And, you know, 15 million Africans are stolen from Africa and brought to the Americas as chattel slave labor um, with their diseases. And certain African mosquitoes also, the Aedes aegypti, for example, hitchhike on, on board these in the bowels of these slave ships. So it's a a wholesale rearrangement of the, the natural ecosystems of the planet with severe consequences and benefits, I suppose. Um, so, for example, the potato comes from the Americas and it finds a home in Europe. Um, so part of this was the exchange of mosquito-borne pathogens and mosquitoes uh, around the world, but specifically in this case to the Americas. All right, so you, you, mentioned, um, you mentioned African slave labor, and I, I want to sort of transition or dovetail the seasoning discussion into this. So my understanding from your book, which is, by the way, called The Mosquito by Timothy Weingard, Dr. Timothy Weingard, I think your book, the, the hypothesis, or maybe it's not a hypothesis, maybe it goes farther than that, is that um, slave owners, slave seekers of America sought out the you know the africans that they did because they were in fact seasoned to you know particular malarias uh, whereas you know slaves from other parts of the world would not have been able to to do the work in the americas in the same way that the africans were is that correct yeah that's certainly um certainly true um so when we look at the columbian exchange as a whole obviously there was no pathogens in 
in the Americas prior to European intrusion. So the indigenous peoples here, some 100 million indigenous peoples living in the Americas prior to Columbus, um, they haven't known European pathogens. So when Columbus comes in successive waves of Europeans, um, 95 million or 95% of the indigenous peoples are dead within 200 years from this onslaught of European disease, which they have no natural immunity to. So originally, indigenous peoples are used as slave labor um, on these plantations, specifically sugar um, and, and tobacco and coffee. Um, again, sugar and coffee are African crops that come as part of the Columbian exchange and are, are, are you know, farmed on slave plantations in the Caribbean and and um, the American colonies uh, with tobacco. Uh, so what happens is they quickly die off, but it's cheaper to use local, obviously indigenous people as slaves than import slaves from somewhere else. That's just, you know, easy economics. Right. So then what they use are uh, European indentured servants. So if you're poor or you're a, a, a convict, you can indenture yourself to a plantation owner for seven years and work essentially as slave labor. And then after seven years, you get free and you get a chunk of your own land to farm tobacco or whatever else. And we see that in Jamestown and Virginia and the Southern American colonies, as well as in the Caribbean and the Spanish colonies. Um, but what they find is that two things is it's easy for you know European indentured servants to run away and just start up shop and two they're dying in droves from yellow fever and malaria on these you know hotbed plantations so Columbus on his fourth voyage is introduces African slavery to the Americas and so obviously they don't know the germ theory at this time and they have no scientific evidence but the visual evidence which is <laughs> quite apparent is that seemingly to the plantation owners and it, it, it's visible is that indigenous and European indentured servants or slaves are dying in droves, whereas Africans seem to be able to survive better in these hotbed plantation colonies. And that's partly because, or mostly because they are seasoned in Africa, which is the birthplace of malaria and yellow fever. So if they survive yellow fever, which is a virus as a child, um, you can't get it again. You build, you have your natural immunity. So, in malaria, they're again seasoned. So also what happens is Africans in Africa develop genetic uh, immunities or genetic shields through natural selection to the two most prevalent and lethal forms of human malaria, which is falciparum and vivax. So this is um, sickle cell, Duffy antigen negativity, so they also have these genetic shields which keep them or safeguard them from malaria as well. So they survive essentially where Europeans and indigenous uh, workers don't. All right. So let's let's pause right there because you, you've just said a whole lot. And it is, I mean, to me, it's in, in, an incredible, maybe it's not a revelation to you, but it is to me. I don't know why. I mean, this this is a part of our history that seems to be um, severely overlooked. I mean, so I, I would just want to restate it because you said it. You said it beautifully, but I want to restate it in very simple terms. And if I'm wrong, please tell me. But I, I think what you said was the original plan for the Americas was to use Native American slave labor. It didn't work because of disease. The next plan was to use indentured slaves, indentured servants from Europe. It didn't work because of the, of malaria and disease, the mosquito primarily. We eventually ended up with African slave labor because they had some immunity, seasoning is what you, the word you used, to malaria. So the mosquito molded and shaped the policy of the United States around slave labor. It, essentially, it, it molded our policy. It molded our, our, our history and our future and who came here because of the, the, the seasoning, the immunity that the African-Americans or the Africans had at the time, that's, that's why they became enslaved. That's it, to me, that's just a piece of history I don't think is, is widely known, and it's just incredible to me. Did I misstate any of that? Nope, you 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 you, <laughs> you summarized it very well. And obviously, again, there's some other factors, but certainly the natural and genetic immunities that Africans had to mosquito-borne pathogens, malaria, and yellow fever played a role in their use as as you know, chattel African slavery, the Atlantic slave trade, and you know, in my opinion, probably if not the worst episode in modern human history.
Yeah, and to go farther than that, I mean, they, they had developed things like sickle cell. You, you started to get into that, and I cut you off, but they had developed things like sickle cell, and I forget what the other uh, partial immunity is. What's it called again? Well, the Duffy, anten yep. Duffy antigen negativity is for vivax malaria. In the Mediterranean, there's another one called thalassemia. There's a bunch of different um, genetic adaptations or shields, but in Africa, the big two are Duffy antigen negativity for vivax malaria, which is the most common form of human malaria, but not the most lethal. And then sickle cell is for the most lethal of the five human strains, which is falciparum malaria. All right, so uh, essentially the, the Africans developed these um, a adaptions, abnormalities. You know, we, we would call them today abnormalities. Sickle cell is not something that you want to have here in the Americas because of, you know, the consequences, the side effects of that. But they, develop, right. they developed these adaptations, these abnormalities, to their red blood cells because the malarial parasite could not actually attach to that red blood cell because of the adaptation, right? I mean, that's, that's essentially how that worked. Right. So our blood cells are oval or round, and the malaria parasite essentially latches onto the blood cell, crawls inside, eat, feeds on the hemoglobin, reproduces, bursts out of the blood cell, and that's when you get fever and sick and chills, and, and this is a continuous cycle till it's picked up in a different form by the mosquito to continue its reproductive cycle before it's put back into a human or another host animal. But if it's um, sickle-shaped, so it won't do that. It, 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 no, it fools the, the parasite can't latch on, but the problem is it's both a savior and a killer at the same time, so... While, yes, it safeguards you from falciparum malaria, it robs your ability to um, transport oxygen in the, in, the, in the bloodstream, and you die. Right, <laughs> right. So it, and what I say in the book is when we think about this from an adaptation or an evolutionary standpoint, to have such a hasty response that's, that's a benefit to survival, which also kills you, it must have been absolutely cataclysmic rates of malaria to promote through natural selection something like sickle cell. Something that and happens so fast. it just so shows fast. the power of malaria um, in Africa to be able to do something like that. So, I mean, it, it was killing at a much higher rate than the 86% that, you know, we saw in the Americas. It, it was killing at a much higher rate than that, and, and they had to adapt, essentially. Um, and live long enough to reproduce and pass on sickle cell because, right. generally speaking, the average, they live to be about 25, but that's old enough to reproduce and pass on sickle cell just to survive as a species in a way. Right, right. It's just uh, absolutely incredible to me. Okay, so we're, we fast-forwarded to, you know, let's just say the 16, well, we know we fast-forwarded to 1608 now because we just talked about slavery. Um, let's fast forward to the American Revolution. Tell me about the American Revolution and how the mosquito affected us. Well, so obviously malaria comes to the Americas with Columbus um, and is introduced in the blood of, of <laughs> Spanish originally and certainly the settlers at Jamestown um, who leave wonderful diaries um, all talk about it's in, in England it's called the ague. So they all talk about having malaria and having the ague, and it's rampant in Jamestown and then in Virginia and across the southern colonies. And even there's epidemics in the northern colonies during the right times of the year. So American colonists or Americans get seasoned to their own malaria, obviously. Um, they live with it. It's a, just a normal fact of life. Um, it's kind of like getting a common cold at that time. So they are seasoned, whereas the British who come over are not. So when we look at the revolution, at the beginning of the war, for the first, call it three, four years, primarily the war is fought in the north, away from the endemic malarial belts in the American colonies. But the British are a little bit annoyed that General Washington will stand and fight, so they changed their grand strategy, if you will, in the final year of the war, and, and they launch a southern campaign beginning in 1780. So General Clinton, who's the commander of the British, dumps Cornwall, General Cornwallis in the south to try to, again, they think there's more loyalists in the south because they're newer colonies, um, Georgia, South Carolina, um, which is actually American 
propaganda that works quite well in London, right. <laughs> disseminated by some spies. So they launch a southern campaign into the malarial, essentially heartland of the American colonies. So there is malaria in England, um, in the eastern kind of counties uh, east of London. There's Kent County uh, malaria, but these soldiers, these 9,000 soldiers under Cornwallis, come from northern England and Scotland, away from the Fenlands or the malarial. Um, swamps of England. So they're not even seasoned to their own malaria in England, let alone the colonial stew here. So what happens is Cornwallis's troops are just cut to pieces by malaria. And if you look at his line of, adv of advance in 1780, 1781, he's zigzagging all across the Carolinas. It, it, it's unbelievable. And actually, he's winning most of these battles. Um, so he's not really running away from the Americans. What he's doing is he's trying to find a, a, a spot to recuperate his soldiers that's free of malaria. And he keeps asking locals, and he, he writes this all down, and this is all in primary sources, about where there's, you know, no ague. And they're like, oh, go 50 miles that way. But again, they're seasoned, so it continues to kind of haunt his forces throughout this southern campaign. Now, General Clinton is convinced that New York is still going to be attacked, so he wants Cornwallis to move north to be available um, for reinforcements if New York's attacked. So he orders Cornwallis to hole up in Yorktown. Now, at this time, Yorktown is about 2,000 people uh, in between the James and York rivers, which is swampland. It's used to grow rice, which is obviously prime mosquito habitat. And Cornwallis begs not to, you know, to be put in this position um, for fear of the ague, but he follows orders. And long story short, as we all know, in August, which was prime mosquito time, um, the, the Americans under General Washington and the French with, you know, General Lafayette and Rochambeau and the French Navy lay siege to Yorktown uh, for a few months. And Cornwallis surrenders. And when he surrenders, he says very clearly that he surrenders not because of anything that the Americans or French do, but because he only has 35 percent of his original 8,000 troops who can stand up, you know, stand to post. The rest are sick or dead um, of malaria. And the German Hessian commander, who's also holed up in Yorktown, these mercenaries that the British hired, uh, corroborates Cornwallis' story as well. And he says there's only about 1,000 British who can actually stand up who aren't sick or dead or dying of malaria. So in a way, the, the female, only female mosquitoes bite. Um, she's a, a founding mother of the United States in a, in a way. Yeah, so, wow. I mean, t absolutely incredible. Uh, I mean, we, we went from um, ancient Rome. Wow. And I asked you the question, can, you know, can, can we legitimately say that Rome survived as long as it did because of the mosquito and malaria? And your answer was, yeah, there are other kind of factors. But, yeah, and, and here we are now talking about the founding of America and, you know, our survival, the colony's survival and, you know, America's eventual survival because of the mosquito and malaria. Uh, just incredible. All right. So, I mean, that's that's the Revolutionary War. We've we've you know, we jumped <laughs> we jumped quite <laughs> a bit. But I want to talk about the Civil War or, or maybe I'm missing something. Should should we should we do French Indian War? Or should we jump straight to Civil War? Your choice. <laughs> it's up to you guys. Um, I mean, the, the French and Indian War, there's um, there's part and parcel, as we call it, the Seven Years. I'm Canadian, so we call it the Seven Years War. Yeah. Um, and certainly, you know, the British takeover of French Canada happens in uh, 1759 at the, the Plains of Abraham in Quebec. Um, and part of that, again, is the French forces of Canada are weakened because uh, yellow fever and malaria are, are, are tearing through the French um, Caribbean colonies. So they need to reinforce these colonies because from an economic standpoint, the plantations on these French colonies in the Caribbean are more valuable than the, the fur and timber coming out of Quebec. So they actually, uh, you know, um, revert or reroute all the French reinforcements to the Caribbean and actually take troops out of Quebec to put in these Caribbean colonies, leaving Quebec quite vulnerable. And that's when, obviously, General Wolfe, um, commanding the British Army, attacks Quebec City. Uh, and it's made relatively easy because of malaria and yellow fever uh, rotting the French troops in the Caribbean. So, again, I'm Canadian, so 
British Canada, in a way, owes part of its establishment to the mosquito as well. Yeah. Um, so there's a story from the you know the Seven Years' War, what the Americans call the French and Indian Wars, um, and the Civil War. It's a bit more convoluted in the Civil War. The role of of there wasn't much yellow fever in the Civil War because of the uh, Anaconda Plan, the blockade of the of the Confederacy. So not a lot of the ships coming from the Caribbean bringing yellow fever into the United States uh, essentially made it through. So yellow fever doesn't really rear rear its head too much during the Civil War as it had done both prior to the Civil War and then after the Civil War when the ports of the South are reopened. There are crippling yellow fever epidemics across um, the South and the Mississippi River watershed. Um, when we see this in the story I talk about, Memphis is just devastated by yellow fever. Um, so it's mostly malaria during the, the Civil War. And we see it, you know, there's lots of reasons for this, mostly because General McClellan was a, a bumbler. Um, but his peninsula campaign is just shrouded by malaria. He himself gets malaria and refuses to let his troops advance until he recovers, which just delays the Union advance to Richmond. And obviously the Confederacy has had a year since first Bull Run to reinforce Richmond. And then once McClellan lands his forces in the Peninsula Campaign, um, they have more time, Generals Johnson and Lee, to reinforce Richmond because he takes so long to advance on Richmond because of malaria. Mm. And it prolongs the war, which then leads to Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation and obviously then the Reconstruct 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. And so slavery is mixed in um, to the mosquito in the Civil War as well. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know how I can reiterate the, the just amazing that the mosquito, you know, like you said, it 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 created a situation in the Civil War which um, gave the South more of an advantage than it otherwise would have had. I mean, you, you know, coming from the South, you always hear these anecdotal stories. The Southern uh, the Southern troops had no shoes, they had no boots, they ran out of rifles, they were ragtag, they had no clothes, they were freezing to death in the northern campaigns. Um, and so, that you know, it seemed seems coming from, at least coming from the South, it seems like they had they were um, underprepared. It's not quite the right word. They were un they they didn't have what they needed to succeed. Okay, let's just put it that way. The, the mos- no, they did not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the mosquito The mosquito gave them, it sounds to me like the mosquito gave the South more of an advantage than um, than they otherwise would have had and prolonged the war and, and, and led to the Emancipation Proclamation. Is that an understatement? Yeah, and no, that's, that's, it's certainly true, when, especially, again, in, in McClellan's Peninsula campaign. It evens the, the, the battlefield, if you will, for the, the Confederacy. Um, and again, there's other factors where the Confederacy um, being on the defensive is always easier in war. If you're a military mind out there, you know that it's you know for every defender you need three attackers. Um, so they were on the defensive, which helps. Certainly, they had better commanders at the beginning of of the war, save Grant in the West, uh, which helps because McClellan was probably, if not, the biggest bumbler of the ham-fisted general of the Civil War, uh, and then a series of of bumblers, uh, Burnside and Hooker uh, in the East. So it does even the playing field. And Union planners talk about something called the Memphis line, where basically if you look at Memphis and draw a line east-west across the U.S., they don't want to penetrate south of there during during um, the mosquito season for fear of yellow fever and malaria. And we see this with Beauregard in the Battle of Corinth um, in, in the West as well, where the Union fails to follow up or chase the Confederate Army further south. Because of the mosquito and because of the Southern, the, the, the Southern troops would have been seasoned, right? I mean, they would have been seasoned at a higher rate than those from the North. And so even though they're fighting, <laughs> fighting on the same yeah. ground, you know, you may have half of your half of your troops that are down and out with malaria if you're from the North, whereas you may have only a quarter of your troops down and out if you're from the south, right? I mean, that's I, I don't know what the yeah. what the statistics would have been, but I mean, is it a two to one? I mean, would you say that the north would have had a two to one disadvantage because of mosquitoes, or what, any idea? Again, it depends on specifically which campaign we look at, uh, even within the Civil War. 
so there's certain campaigns, some of the smaller campaigns that, that go on in, in, you know, Texas and even in Florida, and there's some smaller campaigns where pretty much everybody's <laughs> getting crushed by malaria. Mm -hmm. But in the major campaigns, when we look at the beginning, 1862, really 61, 62 in the West, uh, with the two failed attempts to take Vicksburg, mm -hmm. Prior to Grant's brilliant, brilliant maneuver at Vicksburg in 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 '63, which finally captures Vicksburg, there's two attempts before that um, because, as as Jefferson Davis said, Vicksburg is the linchpin holding the Confederacy together, and the Union troops are absolutely cut to pieces by malaria, um, and that's why they can't take Vicksburg. Um, so, and again, I talked about the Peninsula Campaign where um, the ratio. Um, is it actually in the Peninsula campaign is about two to one uh, between the Confederates and the Union troops? Hmm. I, I don't. I don't. I mean, I, I'm sure. I'm sure we've missed you know some giant portion of of, uh, of history and civilization. Clearly, we could go farther back, and clearly we could go f farther forward. But I, mean, I was thinking we could go way back, can't we? Oh yeah, I mean, I think we can go. We can go way, way back. Um, One hundred ninety million years ago. Back. I know. I'm, I made a joke. You know, uh, Jurassic Park. How they made a big roll of the mosquito in there. I was like, well, maybe that was true. <laughs> well, it's partially true because certainly mosquitoes were feeding on on the dinosaurs. Um, that's that's a hundred percent true. Uh, the mosquitoes been around since the early Jurassic period, so one hundred ninety million years ago. Um, but the problem with Jurassic Park is that, as I said, only females bite. They simply need blood from humans and every other animal on the planet uh, to grow and mature their eggs. Right. So that's why they bite, and then they both drink nectar, male and female. So they are pollinators as well, mosquitoes like bees. Not as much as bees, but they are pollinators. And so the mosquito in Jurassic Park in the actual movie, the very first one, uh, for, they have it all wrong because the one in the amber – uh, which again, we have mosquitoes in amber from you know 80 million years ago from Canada. Right. Um, it's a male mosquito, first off, <laughs> which wouldn't have bitten. And second off, it's one of the very few mosquito species that don't actually bite either male or female. <laughs> there you so go. It's completely wrong. Hey, and Jurassic. The they picked it is because it's. <laughs> It's the biggest, one of the biggest mosquitoes on the planet, and it has nice kind of white stripes and coloration on it. So that's why they picked it, but it's completely not um, factually accurate whatsoever. All right. Jurassic Park revealed right here, <laughs> Trilogy Outdoors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, Dr. Weingard, the, I, I think I read this in your book. There's no, there, it cannot be identified a species that relies solely on the mosquito. For instance, you know, trout don't feed exclusively on the mosquito. They don't need the mosquito, uh, you know, the brim or the bass or whatever, you name it, the fish. Nothing really needs the mosquito, and, and scientists, I think, have not been able to determine any reason for the existence of the mosquito other than to control the human population. Is that true? Well, obviously, lots of things eat mosquitoes, bats, birds, and as you talked about, the topwater fish, so the trout and salmon uh, will eat um, the eggs and the, the pupa that, you know, breed on the, or, you know, breed and grow on the top of the water. So definitely they're a food source for other animals. Are they, if we removed them from that food chain, would it make a difference? Obviously, we don't know. Um, as I mentioned, they are pollinators as well, and, and that's important. And actually, the, the head of the American Orchid Association made sure to tell me that if we removed mosquitoes, certain types of orchids would go extinct because they're only pollinated by mosquitoes. Huh, I didn't so know that. So they are... Um, and again, as from a star, a star Winian, you know, if you disturb the balance of the force, there's some severe repercussions and we don't want the Sith to come back. Sure. So they, you know, there's on un when we start manipulating the natural order with our human agency and human hu hubris, we never know what the unintended outcomes will be. And certainly that's one of the issues with the, the CRISPR 
gene editing technology that, that that's coming out. It certainly can be used for amazing good, but it also could be harnessed for amazing evil at the same time. Yeah. So we don't really know, but it's impo- very important for <laughs> your listeners. There's roughly 2,700 mosquito species on the planet, give or take, probably a little bit more than that now as they're identifying new ones. Um, but of that 2,700 mosquito species, only a few hundred are actually capable of vectoring any pathogens at all, and most of them don't do it very well. So there's there's a handful of mosquito species that are the main culprits, if you will, for the, the vectoring or transference of these pathogens. Now, keep in mind, the mosquito by itself, untethered from a pathogen, is harmless. It's the pathogens that hitch a free ride through the mosquito that are the issue, but you can't have one without the other. So no one is promoting the eradication of all mosquitoes from the face of the earth. Um, that's just silly, and, and, and no health organization or scientists or anything are promoting that. It's specifically targeting these very select species um, like the Anopheles gambi or the Aedes aegypti, um, which spread most of these, these pathogens. So and, that's an important point. <laughs> sure, absolutely. I totally agree. But it, is, it, is it not true that you know, we can't identify any reason for that particular disease process or pathogen process other than to control human population? Uh, that's one argument, and I don't pick sides on this because this is fraught with moral implications and moral arguments and all the rest of it. But sure. certainly that's one side of the argument is that, you know, we're one species among <laughs> billions on this planet and that, you know, all species have predators and that, you know, for unchecked human population growth, the mosquito has acted as a dampering or had a dampering effect on that. So that's certainly one side of the coin or one argument. And again, I'm not, I'm not picking sides on this and I'm not pr- promoting that necessarily, but that's certainly a valid, yes. a valid argument. And, and if you look, you know, there's eight, eight and a half billion people on this planet and, and, and counting. And when we were, you know, hunter gatherers, uh, the, the sustainability from the earth of a hunter gathering human lifestyle is somewhere the estimates are between five and a hundred million people. Mm. So think about five to a hundred million people to eight and a half billion. Yeah. That's crazy. So the mosquitoes lose them, <laughs> I guess. Right. I mean, you know, we had a similar conversation with another member of the Canadian armed forces oh jim shockey did we not yeah. did we not talk about it? i mean almost the hunter and gathering thing we we had the same conversation with jim shockey are you are you familiar with him yeah <laughs> okay i figured yeah uh it, it, um yeah, yeah that's 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 um to me you're right i mean the the human population it has exploded over the course of the last hundred million years obviously um but, you know, one of the things that seems to have kept it in check and is still to this day keeping it in check is the mosquito. I mean, we we don't think about it a lot today because, um, you know, those of us in the West are essentially um, not having to deal with those. But there's there's people all over, the, all over the world that are still dealing with the consequences of malaria and yellow fever. I mean, it's killing a lot of people in Africa and, and, um, and, and Asia and today, correct? Yeah, it's still, I mean, the, the statistics are very tricky because people have um, their own agendas attached to statistics. So mm-hmm. if you're one of the drug companies, which, again, I'm not criticizing them, but if, if they're developing or trying to develop malarial medications or vaccines for some of these viruses like West Nile and dengue, um, your statistics might be on the higher side. Sure. Um, <laughs> to stress the need, which there doesn't need to be stressing. There is a need for these things for sure. But so generally speaking, somewhere between, you know, a million and two million people a year still die of mosquito-borne um, pathogens. That's primarily malaria, but still about 45,000 a year from yellow fever, even though there's been a, a very uh, effective vaccine since the 1930s. Um but dengue is the fastest growing mosquito borne pathogen on the planet. And currently over um, four and a half billion people are at risk from dengue alone, wow. uh, which is shocking when you think about that. And the danger is with global warming, these mosquitoes, these tropical mosquitoes are pushing the northern limit, northern limit line. So specifically, and I, this Aedes aegypti, I keep mentioning this, but this is the, the bad, <laughs> the bad mosquito, if you will. Um, 
and it was discovered as far north as the Great Lakes region of Ontario, where I'm from, in 2016. Mm. So we're, we're seeing um, cases of domestic dengue, uh, chikungunya in Texas and Florida, as well as West Nile and Zika. So it is a danger when we look at, you know, ecosystems and when they're warming up, these mosquitoes can then survive and breed further north. And as I said, in 2016, the Aedes aegypti was was spotted in, in southwestern Ontario in, in the Great Lakes region. So it is something that, you know, people are keeping an eye on. Yeah. Um, so uh, we have made mistakes with mosquitoes in the past. I mean, DDT, for instance, seems like it was a mistake. <laughs> I don't know how you classify it as anything other than a mistake. What, well, let's talk about that for a second. What, what is DDT? So DDT is... And essentially, it's an insecticide, um, and there's two sides to DDT. That, and again, a lot of things get convoluted in history and get you know a little bit warped, if you will. So, in the Second World War, General MacArthur urges the American government to do something about malaria, because in the Pacific, the Americans, and as we find out later, the Japanese as well, were getting just cut to pieces by malaria um not yellow fever because there is a vaccine by that time uh, american canadian british all our gis got their yellow fever vaccine which saved how many hundreds of thousands of lives during the war so he's urging the the government to do something and i'll paraphrase a quote from macarthur but he said this will be a very long war if for every division in the field i have one on leave and one in the hospital with malaria mm. So he's very, you know, insistent that the government step up. So there are, uh, you know, allied troops are also getting malaria in North Africa and then in Sicily and certainly throughout Italy. So they developed something called the Malaria Project, which is given the same scope of secrecy as the Manhattan Project to develop not only malarial medications like Adabrin or chloroquine comes out of this as well, but also DDT comes out of this. So by 1942-43, they're spraying DDT in the you know active theaters of war. And long story short, in in after the war in Italy, when they spray DDT, it cuts the malarial rates across Italy by 90 percent, almost overnight. It is a miraculous mosquito killer like a marine it is amazing mm. but what happens in 1949 is ddt is re released commercially to farmers mm. so what happens is they literally carpet bomb the planet with ddt mm. and this is when we get the environmental degradation happening from the the use of ddt in agriculture not so much the use or what would be surgical use of spraying ddt around people's windows that's not going to, it's not in substantial enough quantities to enter the food chain like it does. Why it enters, why it causes, you know, human cancers and animal cancers. And as Joni Mitchell says, farmers, farmers, put away your DDT, leave me spots on my apples and leave me the birds and the bees. She's right. It's the agricultural, literally carpet bombing use of DDT that causes the environmental degradation and all the cancers and issues with animals and entering the food chain, as you will. So yeah, I, that's I, part of it. I didn't, I, okay, it's something else I didn't know. I mean, I'm glad that we had this discussion. I just, I just assumed that the proliferation through the military campaigns is what eventually caused the issue, and, you know, or, or maybe our, our acknowledgement of the issue. But it, you, you're saying that the military use of the product was not a problem at all. It was really only once it was released to the agricultural sector. I didn't know that. Well, it's not healthy. Like, it, what they're spraying DDT directly on troops. I'm not saying that's healthy, but sure. when we want to yeah. talk about the global implications of DDT in the water and in the food chain of, of the fish and the animals, and then including human beings, that is because of the literally, they're flying planes over the world just carpet bombing the planet with DDT. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how it enters the food chain and causes the destruction that it does keep in mind that uh, that silent spring is not released until 1962 uh with rachel carson's seminal you know environmental book and she's not wrong it's just by that time you've had almost 15 years of of, of just blasting the planet with this stuff 
on all of our crops across the world. Um, so what eventually happens, though, is mosquitoes adapt very quickly. Mm. So on average, the average mosquito, it took them seven years to become immune to DDT. Wow. So we ban DDT, not generally so much because of, of any political clout or any an environmental clout or maybe certainly anything Rachel wrote. We ban it because, in, in part, because it simply doesn't work anymore. Mm. Because we've, we've exposed mosquitoes across the planet to DDT, and as I said, on average, it takes seven years, uh, depending on the species, but the average is seven years for them to become immune to DDT. So it just simply wears out its welcome. So they, they've adapted immunity to it after seven years. I wonder if they're immune to it today, as it, uh, if they've lost their immunity. There's, <laughs> that's the interesting part is now certain countries uh, – uh, don't quote me on this, but I think the only countries that produce DDT still are India and North Korea, but I don't know that for sure, but that's, uh, it's in the book. Mm, right. <laughs> but I think that's right. But countries are now, they're doing experiments again with DDT uh, because it was such a miraculous like panacea for killing mosquitoes and lowering you know, the mosquito-borne disease rates, is that because it hasn't been used in so long, that it actually is starting to work again on pockets of mosquitoes because it's it's you know it's been out of their kind of ecosystem or their evolutionary adaptations for so long, so there are calls, if you will, by certain groups across the world to bring back DDT. Um, Hopefully, I don't think that's going to happen, but the, yeah. certainly there is that argument out there. Hopefully, not on the carpet bombing uh, level. <laughs> no, no. If you'd like to spray it in behind a way, my house. probably not on any, not on any level, in my opinion. Right. I'm sitting over here, scared to death, <clears throat> thinking about it. But um, you're going over to an area this group that's prevalent for all of these terrible mosquitoes in a year. Mm -hmm. Have you been vaccinated? Are you in the process of being vaccinated? How's that work? Well, we have to have yellow fever cards and all that good stuff. But it, it, you know, and that that leads. It's a good question, English Capney. So. Um, the first time my wife and I went to Africa, the first time, which was quite a few, uh, a, lot, a lot of years ago, um, we were prescribed medicine that is, is essentially military-grade medicine. I think I had taken it in the past. My wife had not taken it in the past. It was called mefloquine. You remember mefloquine? Dr. Weingart? Yeah, I've taken it. Yeah. and I, <laughs> I took it as well. I'll tell you, she had a terrible reaction to it. it I mean, it almost, it, it could only be described as psychosis. I mean, oh, there, wow. There is no other way. Yeah, she, there's. Um, it was a horrible. No, you're right. I had, I had, I didn't have the psychosis, but my dreams were as far out and, you know, psychedelic if you want to use that word as i've ever like i've never experienced dreams like this before in my life so i actually stopped taking it yeah. um because i knew it didn't work anyway um <laughs> yeah but I mean, yes there's class action lawsuits from groups of veterans in canada the u.s and britain uh against the governments you know if you will um because of what they call permanent psychosis from these malarial medications. They could cause um, suicide. Yeah. Yep. Oh. And of course, they're, they're saying, well, no, it's PTSD. And the doctors are saying, no, this is not PTSD. This is this is something different. This is um, – so anyway, there's a – yeah, currently there's there's lawsuits against the governments from veterans. Um, in, in Somalia, there was an issue with the Canadian Airborne, um, and then actually got the – our Airborne disbanded. Um and scattered across our, our regular units because of some murder and mayhem that they did in Somalia and, and this, with, you know, Black Hawk Down, you know, era. Yeah. And they're thinking this was maybe due to, um, psych, you know, temporary psychosis because of this malaria medication. Yeah. I'm being, wow. I'm being deployed uh, next year uh, and um, we'll be near Somalia, a place near Somalia. And, and so that's why English was uh, was asking about the medications, but um, yeah, I mean, meth the new me one is not, but the newer one is not. They're called right. Artemis and in combination therapy. It has nothing to do with malarone or methylquin right. or chloroquine or any of those derivatives. So, um, 
again, it's starting not to work in pockets of the planet because the mosquito or the malaria parasite, sorry, adapts so quickly that it, it again, has worn out its welcome. Wow. Uh, like everything else we've tried, which is why malaria is still a huge killer, is the problem is, is when we do human trials with these drugs, we expose the, 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 the malaria plasmodium to these drugs. And so by the time we do these, by the time it's ready and safe to be released to the, to the market, if you will, there's been years and years and years where malaria has already been exposed to these drugs, and so they very quickly develop resistance. So these drugs have a very short shelf life because of the quick adaptation of the malaria plasmodium. Yeah. Before we get off the phone, I'd like to clarify that my wife is no longer experiencing psychosis. Uh, well, just that's a good thing. I want to clarify, I feel like maybe I left that hanging. No, the rest of her psychosis <laughs> is from dealing with you. <laughs> uh, Dr. Weingard, this has been an amazing conversation, uh, enlightening. The mosquito has changed the world. It's changed human civilization, and your book which is literally called The Mosquito. Yep, we'll put links up to it. We'll put links up to it. I highly encourage anybody listening to the sound of my voice to get this book and to read it. It's um, it, it's not a novel, and it's not really... Um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a book of nonfiction, right? But it, it almost reads like a novel because it goes through history in sort of the same sort of time line that I tried to follow. We jumped around a little bit, but we went from ancient Rome to uh, Columbus to the American Revolution to the Civil War to World War II. So I tried to follow the timeline, uh, but Dr. Weingard does a much better job in his book of doing that. Reads almost like a novel, very entertaining and very interesting. You'll be smarter if you read it. And he's trying to hand it to me right now, Dr. Weingard, just so you know. I'm making sure. <laughs> he's, he's trying to reach across well, the desk and hand you. it to me. Read it. Um, nice. Yeah. Hey, we didn't even get to talk a lot about him, but by the way, y'all, uh, he's the hockey coach. Yeah, at, you're the head hockey coach at Colorado Mason? Yeah. Yeah, well, my real job is a professor, obviously, a right. history professor at Colorado Mason University, but um, – my wife is from Grand Junction, Colorado, so I'm Canadian. So I moved here about 10 years ago, and they didn't have a hockey team when I got a job teaching, and I couldn't believe that. So I started the hockey team and have been the head coach ever since at the university. So I, I so my, my two passions, hockey and history, in, in all in one, it's genius. That's awesome. I, I come, I, I fly into Grand Junction usually at least twice a year. Um, I'm coming out in October and in November. October for first season rifle uh, and November for second season rifle deer. Um, I have mm -hmm. I have great friends that live in Palisade right outside of Junction, and um, yeah. he he's actually the one that turned me on to your book. He's a lawyer in Grand Junction named Jim Geesey. Um, don't know if you've that ever doesn't ring a bell, but yeah, he went to Colorado Mesa and um, oh, nice. found your book somehow, and and I think I may have stolen it from his house in Palisade and read it on my ride back to South Carolina. Um, anyway, highly recommended The Mosquito, Dr. Timothy Weingard. Thanks so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Thank you. I'll tell you what, folks, that is a great, great episode. Uh, I think that's 21 of Trilogy Outdoors and want to thank Dr. Weingard. Go get a hold of that book. And, you know, today it wasn't about fins, fur, and feathers, but it really was. I mean, everything we cover is fins, fur, and feathers. But it sure does have a lot to do with it. Y'all go check out all of our platforms. Make sure you click, click on subscribe there, and uh, we'll have you another episode coming up next week. So uh, we'll see y'all then. Trilogy Outdoors podcast is a product of Trilogy Outdoors Media. All views and opinions of our hosts and guests are not necessarily those of our sponsors. Trilogy Outdoors is produced and edited by Trilogy Outdoors Media. Be sure to follow us on all the podcast platforms as well as our social media pages on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And also, don't forget our other brands, Southern English Radio Show and Walk em All Outdoor Magazine. To find more information, visit TrilogyOutdoorsMedia.com. And remember, if it's anything dealing with fins, fur, and feathers, you're going to find it right here on Trilogy outdoors.